in Nigeria is serving as a clock to the wheel of progress in executing government you know, pro uh, projects or contracts. And it is also said that it does not favor our indigenous companies in the construction industry, and in particular, small and medium enterprises are not getting a good bargain because of the very many qualifications. What would be your take with respect to this? Secondly, I'm from Niger State, and Niger State has over 2,165 kilometers of federal roads, which means if you are coming from the north to the south or vice versa, you are bound to encounter a road in Niger State. And because of the heavy traffic, currently I don't think Niger State has any 100 kilometers of stretch of road that is very much rebel. I know you've made so much effort, but if we are by chance taken back to this ministry, what would we be doing differently that the very good people of Niger will feel very happy that that story of the blind man who says we are in Niger simply because he has had the gallop of the road, he will say yes, we are now in Niger State because of the peculiar nature of Niger roads. What will you be saying differently so that our people will have that hope that the Biningwari Road to Tegina and to uh, Makera and the like will come back to life? Because these roads have been completely abandoned now. That is why the uh, Mokwa Bida Road coming through to Suleja is now the main road people take. That itself is also suffering from a lot of pressure. So what will you be doing differently so that we don't end up losing all the roads that will take us to our various constituencies? Thank you. Okene Road, Okene, Auchi, Auchi, Ekoma. And this road, money has been budgeted year in, year out, every year. And if you come back again as a minister on this road, what are we going to do about this road? Right now, the road is not possible, especially Okene to Auchi. There is one. The budget money on this road year in, year out. Then you talk about this second question on housing. Money was budgeted for the housing as well. And for the past four years, your ministry never commissioned any project, any housing project. I didn't see anyone. And if you, if you have done anyone in any state, they have not done anyone in Edo, what are you going to do? What happened to this fund that was released to you for housing? The, the third one is not just an advice. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Just two. Just two. representing Gombe Central. Your Excellency, Mr. Nomini, uh, right now, as you know, there are hundreds of roads eaten across the country. Some have been there, have been ongoing, sometimes abandoned for two, three years, then work resumes, then work is abandoned. To the extent that there are so many roads that have been awarded by the Ministry of Works, but you hardly, throughout the year, you hardly hear or see either Mr. President or the Minister of Works commissioning a fully, fully completed road. Most roads are ongoing, every year ongoing, every year ongoing, ongoing, ongoing. You know in private, I've discussed with you on this issue on about two or three occasions. I say, is there no way, is there no way, Mr. Mr. Nomini, if you go back, that you can categorize these roads and, and to categorize them make sure each part of this country benefits. Because it's very, very important. You should not be categorized in favor of one section of the country or another. But in a way that every year, you, you, you complete some roads, two, three, four, where, where Mr. President will go, or you will go, or somebody will go on commission so that they will be put to use. But it doesn't make sense, unless you have better reasons to tell us now. 
whereby every year we keep awarding new roads, new roads, new open, new, and they are all they are all ongoing, always perpetually ongoing. Is there no way you can stop this so that we can at least every year someone will be fully commissioned and completed? That's question number one. Question. My second question is to do with power. Mr. Nomini, you know that the power reform affected by the federal government is with a view to giving stable electricity to Nigeria. Somehow, somehow, every day we hear of complaints from the Jankos, no payment, that they are being owed billions and billions of Naira. You hear of discourse complaining that they don't have money and hear of story where this could don't invest in transformers to the extent that now these days communities buy their own transformers. Or we in the National Assembly through our constituency projects also buy transformers to our various communities, which should not be the case. Should have been a substitute of the discourse. Now, in your opinion, do you think this present reform which has been effected whereby uh, generation and distribution have been privatized. Only transmission is retained by government. Do you think going by this arrangement, we can ever achieve, we can ever achieve without prejudice to the Siemens uh, arrangement with the federal government, we will ever achieve stable power supply in this country? Thank you very much. Uh, let me just say that in some other, so starting with Senator Danjuma Goji's question, in some other jurisdictions, government has decided to hold the retail end, which is this school. So in some places, they have decided to hold the generation. We chose to hold the transmission. And so there's really nothing wrong in what model you choose. I have alluded here earlier, sir, to the powers of the regulator. Let me speak to two powers that the regulator has in, I think, sections 73, 74, and 75 of the Electric Power Sector Reform Act. On the complaint of a consumer or another licensee, and this goes Jenkos and TCN are licensees, that any licensee is not carrying out his function properly. One of the powers that was vested by that law in the regulator neck is to undertake an investigation and do one of several things, including amending the license of that licensee or even canceling the license. As we have seen in cases like the Central Bank and as we have seen in some cases with the NCC as we have seen with the Nigerian Broadcasting Co Commission. So the powers of the regulator for ref making the reform work must be targeted towards ensuring that minimum service levels, licensing conditions are met. And until we fully exhaust those powers, it will be premature to say that the reform is not working. But oftentimes when we privatize things, who goes back to check the service level compliance. Who pulls a lever of caution or compulsion, as the case may be, for us? And, and I think that is something all of us should uh, 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 spend some time to look at. The South African model, for example, with which we have sometimes spoken, sadly, in derogatory nature about our nation, is not perfect. It is indebted massively. It continues to benefit from government funding. Now, when the discourse, for example, government is a holder of 40% of the shares of discourse. And it holds 40% on behalf of the federal government, the states, the local governments, and the, 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 the labor unions. So as a shareholder, it must also invest. And I think that is my understanding of the Siemens intervention, which 
uh, was spoken about by one of your distinguished colleagues, and I'm, I want to take them together, just to say that at this time, uh, whatever investments is coming through Siemens will have to be worked into the existing arrangements. But I was not around when that agreement was concluded, so I can't speak here to the final details of what it contains because I have not yet read it. About commissioning roads, I'm happy uh, uh, Distinguished Senator Danjima Goje brought this up in the open. These were discussions we have had privately because I approached him as chairman of appropriation committee and that if the decision were mine, and I've made this recommendation in the Federal Executive Council, that if the decision were mine to make, as I once did when I was in Lagos, that there will be a year or two years where there will be no new projects. And if we can come to that as a nation, and this is the challenge of liberal democracy, really, how to build consensus amongst all of the eminent men and women who are representing various parts of the country with a mandate to bring home development. But if we can have consensus about this and say this year, let us have no new projects, let us prioritize. We can't have everything we want at the same time. So if, for example, all of these distinguished senators from the southeast, three from each state, we make the Enugu Potako Road with the senators from Enugu, 18 of them, as their priority project. The uh, Kanu Maiduguri Road crosses about seven states. You will have 21 or so senators saying, this is our commitment to all our people while we are here. And if we look at the Lagos Ibado Expressway serving three states, nine senators there, the Ajeba Andele or Bini serves Ogun, uh, Ondo, Edo State, and so on and so forth. We can begin to have consensus about our priorities. We cannot do all of what we want at one. The life of a nation cannot be dealt with in more than four, in, in four years. It requires more than four. It's a, it's a going concern. So th those will be my broad recommendations that I am willing to take up as a more auspicious and time-permitting forum. But I think that they, they may provide a way forward. And I think, in, in a sense, I have answered what distinguished Senator Francis Ali McKenna alluded to, except to provide some clarification. Some sections of that Bini or Kenya Aochi route have actually been finished. The section from Bini to uh, Azura, and so I've been finished. The problematic section is the one that you mentioned. And the problem there is that there is currently no drain to take out water. It's a low water table area. So if we build as it currently is, the road will fail again. And so I have challenged our engineers, and we, they were working on a drainage solution with the contractor until I left office. So if we don't drain that place, it just will not happen. And what will we do differently? What we have done throughout rainy season and Christmas when there's heavy traffic and flooding is to at least make it moderable to ease the plight of, uh, of commuters. And I think that you will acknowledge that this has happened repeatedly. We want to find a final solution. Let me say again that uh, I, well, Niger State, uh, distinguished Senator Sabi Abdullahi will agree that we have moved the needle a little bit. Uh, again, problem, of course, is how much money will we get? Because it is one thing to make the budget, and I think it is common knowledge here that no ministry has received all of the resources for its budget. So, yes, we gladly announce Ministry of Power, Works, and Housing has 500 billion naira budget, but we seldom get more than 250, 280 at peak. So, Nigeria is not yet the rich nation that I know that it will be. It isn't yet. So there's a gap between our anticipated spending and what we really earn. Um, in terms of procurement, yes, I agree, and we have discussed this uh, severally. There are many issues with the procurement system. It seeks, I think, to, to uh, uh, achieve value for money. Uh, whether it has done that efficiently is debatable but it also excludes some of the most vulnerable people in our society. Small and medium uh, and very basic people, people who want to pay children's school fees, who want to pay medical bills, people who want to pay their house rent. 
They want to benefit from the procurement. People you represent, that we represent, and they can't benefit because the conditions for benefiting are too onerous. So they have to bring all sorts of documents which they never have. So the cost of getting those documents becomes something that makes them unable to benefit. So we started a national maintenance infra infrastructure, uh, infrastructure maintenance program. This is a process by which we uh, seek to engage a lot of artisans, plumbers, welders, uh, carpenters, uh, bricklayers, R&A, refrigeration, heating, ventilation, and cooling practitioners. But I am afraid that as the procurement law presently stands, it is only the big people who will make more money or who will get the contracts and then engage these people. So and I have made the recommendations to many of the distinguished senators, and I hope that we will see a, a, a rescoping of that law. The, the expectation that have been expressed here also for projects to be completed on time are not compatible. Our expectation of speed is not compatible with what we have enacted in our law, where we have to first do a procurement plan, where you finish that, it gets approved, then you advertise it for six weeks, then there are thousands of bids, then we get human rights, civil society to come and witness everything, then after that, then there are petitions, and so on and so on. It is not compatible with the speed at which we want to move. So our law is holding us back. And the law is made for us. We are not made for the law. And I hope that distinguished senators will rise up to this challenge and look at this as a matter of expedition. Let me regulation, because it is raised by distinguished senator. It's a very important point, and you will have heard me at some public fora speaking about the need to recruit some of the very best of our human capital into our public service. And I am developing a paper that I hope to share. But the answer simply is we need more professionalism within the regulatory bodies. Uh, professionals must be able to hold themselves to the highest possible standards across board. And I think that if Nigeria's professional elite take up this responsibility, Nigeria will be a much better place. Distinguished Senator Okorocha, um, I think I have addressed the issues of funding uh, while you, you stepped out, but the point to make again is to repeat what I said, that the budgets do not get full cash funding. Our budgets are deficit budgets, as you probably also will have experienced whilst in IMU. And therefore, we need to find more money. My recommendation is for, was to suggest we raise an infrastructure bond where all Nigerians can contribute their small, small token. And let's see how far that takes us. Uh, we also are utilizing PPPs, but again, Something like the tax credit initiative, people have not understood it sufficiently, and maybe I should say a word about it here. It is an advance credit of the company's income tax to government, an advance credit of its income tax. And therefore, for a company to benefit, so if you want to do a 10 billion naira road with your income tax paid in advance, it means first that you must make profit of an amount that equivalents or have a record of up to 10 billion. How many of our companies even turn over 10 billion before we begin to tax them? So that, that is a problem with that. But it has shown some appetite by some of the, the big players and the, the, the room for more scope clearly exists. Um, the question about what is holding Mambila, that's a very important question. Mambila has been in the front burner. I think that this administration can take credit for having been the one that finally issues a binding contract. There was never a binding contract on Mambila. All of the contracts, one thing was wrong. It didn't pass through FEC. It was somebody, there were court cases. This was the first time an EPC, Engineering Procurement and Construction Contract, was issued. Now, having issued that contract, as I said, there is funding issue by the Chinese uh, government, but there are also issues about now demarcating the precise area to coordinate, and we have employed surveyors to do that. FEC approved that memo working with the Taraba state government to start that. 
we were awaiting the report when I left. That would then lead us to, after defining the territory, for example, if we wanted to build in this Senate, it may well be that the footprint of the project may not get to your seat. And so we have to enumerate all of the senators whose seats will be affected and who will be paid compensation and draw a boundary. And from there, of course, some advanced work is going on backstage that people will not see. But uh, some progress has been made. There was a question about Taraba Centra. I think from you, I'm not sure which part is Taraba Centra now. Is it, I will come to it, sir. Uh, is it close to Wukari Takum area? Bali. Okay, I'm not quite sure because I was going to bring your attention to the Kashimbila project, which we had neared completion of the transmission line now. And I think once that is uh, commissioned, it is possible to extend its width to uh, some parts of Taraba Central. The EB Bridge, I think, and I have to be careful here, I know that it has cleared procurement. I am not sure, and I, do, I don't want to say, I can't recollect very clearly now, but I think, I think that we awarded it in the Federal Executive Council. Um, um, then, um, well, the policy about displaced people and housing, I think is a, is a very important and compassionate point. But I will support a policy along those lines. But let us remember that the federal government is not the one in control of land, and you can't build houses without land. It is the state governors and the state governments who control land. The models we have started with have actually proceeded on the basis of asking states to give us land as pilot projects. Um, Well, uh, I think there was a question about, uh, I think from Senator Gian, something about uh, Akwanga, Joss Bauchi. I think that road has also, phase one of it has been awarded. Phase two is under procurement, and the financing approval will still have to come back to parliament because it is funded by a Chinese loan. And I hope that when it does come, distinguished Senator Gian will give support to whoever the minister assigned to that ministry is to get the funding for it. But let me again say that between policy, implementation, and results, there is quite some distance that needs to be covered. And all of us, as leaders of government, must continue to carry this message to our people. But I think that Nigeria is making some progress. There's infrastructure deficit across the world. And None of the European countries now, the UK, the US, all of them are fighting about making big budgets to rebuild or renew their infrastructure. So we are not alone, but we have our work cut out for us, and I believe that it can be done. Um, I think I will leave it there, sir. I think I've tried to summarize it. Thank you very much, sir. So I will call on the... Um, let me be gender sensitive, only two, Senator Uche Lilian and Senator Elisha Ishaku Abu. Elisha is a man. <laughs> He's a man. Is that a woman? <laughs> Elisha is a man. <laughs> what a... <laughs> Uh, Mr. President, Mr. President, I'm from Anambra State, representing Anambra Central. I have two questions, but one has been taken care of. So let me go to the one that concerns me directly with my constituents, too. Uh, congratulations, Honorable Minister. My question is this the construction of Enugu Oka on Echa Road has prolonged for too long. It's been there for too long. It's, it's, it has lingered for so much. I would, I would like to know, what is holding that road from being completed? Every year, a contractor will appear and disappear. 
If you go to the axis of Amorbia, between Amorbia and Umobu, this is a journey that will take you just three minutes, but it will take you one hour. From Enugu to Anicha will ordinarily take you 45 minutes, but now three hours, you're still on the same road. I went to represent Mr. President on Saturday on a function, a journey that would have taken me uh, 40 minutes. I was there for four and a half hours. I wanted to call Mr. President to send me a helicopter to lift me up. <laughs> but unfortunately, network was bad too. So I would like to know, Honorable Minister, what are you going to do first of all to put palliatives on the road to ensure that at least road users will not continue to suffer? Why the main job of completing the road would come? Um, and I will also want you to tell us the actual story on that road because that road has been there for years. It's been there for years. Thank you very much. Well, let me clear. I meant to call a female senator and a male senator. So, <laughs> Senator Abu. <laughs> Mr. Senate President, sitting as a chair, my name is Senator Ishiaku Abu, representing people of Adamawa North in the body of the Nigerian Senate. My question is just straightforward. As a very important voice, as a very important person, whose voice is respected. As a very important person whose voice is respected at the Federal Executive Council, I want to know, sir, why in 2019 budget alone, the federal government budgeted over 107 billion naira for railways alone. And the Northeast was excluded, leaving only Meduguri Red. Leaving out now economically viable place or towns like Mubi, which is actually the second biggest market in the whole of northern Nigeria after Kano State. And also, the biggest cow market in the whole of West Africa, leaving it for only roads that are not so good. What is your plan, sir, of actually extending these railway lines to these places? No. Number two, no. Chair, please protect me, sir. Me protect me, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Secondly, sir, since 2013, that after the Boko Haram attacks, my people went back home. Till then, the towns of Michka and Madagali is still cut off from national greed. They are still using candles in the two local government in the 21st century. Our bridge is also is still blown up, even though the contract was awarded in 2016. What is your plan, sir, to these places? Thank you. Uh, the Enugu Oka Road is true of all of the problems that we met. And I think the important thing first is that it may look expected, but it has not happened in a long time, that a government will inherit the projects of its preceding government and deal with them and own them as if they truly were our own. And it may seem ordinary, but uh, it hasn't happened a lot. And, and that was what Mr. President required of all of his ministers. And so, one of the problems on that road in context was that some of the contractors to whom it had been awarded had not discharged their obligations as and when due. Not because they were totally blameless, uh, uh, full of blame, because some of it must also come back to us. The issue we have spoken about, we budget 10 naira, we can only raise 3 naira. 
And if the contractor can't pay his staff, he can't lubricate his equipment, he can't order granite, laterite, bitumen, and pay his suppliers, he will shut down. That, those were the realities. Now, there were also some problems, particularly at the ninth mile section. And there were issues that required us to investigate and ultimately change the design because there were suspicions that there might have been some uh, heavy deposits of coal underneath that place that was making it fail. So we have resolved all of those problems now. Our, the most difficult section, if I remember, was the Amansia Umuya section. I was there, and I think they were surfacing it in December, and I think I sent a team there. On the day I was supposed to go there, uh, I couldn't get there because of bad weather, because I was to connect from Port Harcourt. And my team were there, and I think this was in May, and our contractors were still working. But trust me, once contractors run out of money, they will stop work. Contractors don't keep iron rod, they don't keep cement, they don't keep bitumen, they don't keep laterite, they don't keep gravel or asphalt. They order them when we pay them. So, and except for basic equipment that they need to run, they lay off staff too in order to manage their overheads and retain profitability. So that is the big elephant in the room of Nigeria's infrastructure. How do we fund that? And I think it's a matter all of us uh, can benefit from each other's experience and uh, learning. Um, distinguished Senator Abo, I am not the minister that was responsible for rail. It was under the Ministry of Transportation. But I recall what my colleague used to tell us at the time, that the cost of the uh, uh, rail from uh, the southeast and south-south through to Maiduguri, which was within his contemplation always, it was something he was very passionate about, was going to cost us uh, multiples of billions of dollars. If I remember off the top of my head, we were looking, I think, about something like 12 or 21 billion dollars, and I don't want to be quoted on this, but there was a lot of money. And here we are, the money was supposed, the funding for the current one has come from the Chinese. We are looking to raise about five billion dollars from the Chinese from Mambila, and all that China has put during the FOCAC uh, lending to the whole of Africa was just 60 billion dollars for 53 countries. So, but it is a possibility, and I think the, the way to look at things is that something has started, and therefore, if we do one, we will do two. If we do two, we will get to four, and get to eight, and get to 16. Uh, Michika and Madagali, I think the, the point I want to make here is that they are examples. What you feel, what your community feels, are strong reasons, strong examples of why we must all come together instead of beating drums of war. Because when war happens, this is what you see. In my interactions with the Army Corps of Engineers, because our contractors were leaving the place, they said they couldn't work there. So what we did was to call in the Army Corps of Engineers to come and take over these roads. And we then found out that it was even some of our own military who blew up the infrastructure as a strategy for containing terror. So when war breaks out, people are not, those who fight wars are not concerned about health care, well-being. Unfortunately, it is men, it is women and children who are the first victims. And then our infrastructure is destroyed. So you cannot recognize cities like Homs in Syria and Baghdad in Iraq anymore. They've been leveled by war. And what happens thereafter is a rebuilding process. And I think that it is important that all of us must learn from what happened in 1966, what it led to, and what followed after, a national reconstruction project. And I think that's what we have started with the Northeast Development Project. And I hope the lessons of the pain will endure and take us towards the path of brotherhood and peaceful coexistence. Thank you. The song uh, my colleagues, I know they are going to say something to thank my distinguished colleagues for the support that our honorable ministers have enjoyed today, because I know what our colleagues can do. So I want to thank you, and I'm also a senator, so, and thank you for even telling 
us that we, it should take a bow at this point. So, please. I, <laughs> so, I want to really thank you. And also, my only addition is that I remember that even your first tenure, I didn't get any chance to give employment letters to my constituents. So when you get there this time, just remember senators here, we have people back home, our constituents, asking us for employment slots. And as senators, we don't, huh? yes, it's qualified, definitely. So I want you to put that in your agenda for the second term, that we all need slots for employment for our constituents. I want to thank my distinguished colleagues again for this usual support. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, um, Mr. President of the Senate, sitting comfortably as the chairman, very distinguished colleague. Let me say that it has been a very, very revealing and very, very good discussion between the Senate and the ministerial nominee. Mr. President, I want to believe that the ministerial nominee has taken in all questions and he has provided us adequate answers, telling us his capacity and the capability to perform. He has also made it known to us that despite our huge expectation, especially in the critical three critical sectors which he held in the last four years, he has said that the availability of funds has been a major challenge. He also has put together solution going forward as to what and what can be done. And I believe with all of this that we have listened and we have heard from him, I want to seek the indulgence of the chair and the benevolence of my colleague that we allow the nominee to take a bow and go. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, for giving me this privilege. I thank you. I thank my senior colleague, the ranking. I am almost fed up of ranking, ranking. Even in talking, you, 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 you call us in a ranking, a ranking order. So I must thank you for calling me at last. However, Mr. Chairman and distinguished colleagues, I'm happy to be here and I'm, I'm, I'm fulfilled today to be part of you. The man the nominee standing over there is a man of honor. I'm sorry to say this. You know, even if you have a good product, you still need a little bit of ad advertisement. Because the more you did the advert, uh, advert, you advertise, the more the merrier. The man standing there, he was governor of Lagos State. That is a known fact. He's a golden fish. The more you ask questions, you just want to make him to share because he's a son. He's a son. He's a son with sound mind, so he can take care of, of the question. But where I am going, the man is a lover of democracy. And why I must say this is because of past uh, what he contributed in the last eight, nine years to the development of Lagos and, and Nigeria in general, and of course to the parliament. I will not forget so soon the issue of mega city in Lagos. Everybody all over the world, they are agitated, looking, planning for their state to be a mega city. And this is a state, it's a status. You don't buy it at mall. You, you, it's a status, you earn it. It is possible in Lagos, the mega city, because of the role he played. He's one of those who make things happen in Lagos. And that singular effort, I'm sorry, to measure a state as a mega city, it is run by your population. As you know, I'm sorry. You have to, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm not, Mr. Chairman, because Mr. Chairman, I believe there is no preferential treatment in this hall. If you can save others from emulation, I think I am, you have to save me too. I'm saying this with, thank you, sir. I'm saying this with all assertion. Because for a state to be a mega city, all of the state, all federal states in Nigeria want to, be, want to have a mega city. It is being combined by your high yard, by your population, including the infrastructure. Without infrastructure, with your population high yard, they can't give you status of mega city. Now, where I'm going is this. Where I'm going, Mr. Shia, where I'm going is this. We are not even any longer discussing mega city in Lagos. 
We have metamorphosed to the position of smart city, the lack of Europe and Dubai. So if this man can be a member of those who play that role, I think if there is anything worthy, you are a worthy person. He's a straightforward person, honest person, man of integrity, not only that, with uncommon transformation. And as a transformer, and I'm saying this with all assertion, as a transformer, he has established that, demonstrated that in Lagos and, and as a minister of federal Republic of Nigeria. On this note, I am not asking you, sir, to allow him to take a vow, but I am appealing, soliciting, that if you give him a soft landing, it's not going to make you, it will, it's going to make you happy. You will not regret it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have done justice and we could do even more, but time will not permit. I want to appeal to those who raise their hands, but uh, are not able to speak. Uh, we could still have uh, interactions with him when he becomes uh, uh, an honor minister, whether it's in works or elsewhere, because I'm sure most of us have issues coming from his um, sojourn as Minister of Power, housing, Works and Housing. So I want to appeal to all of us that we, we should allow him uh, to take a bow and go. But before I put that question, let me recognize uh, our former colleagues seated there, Senator Benga Ashafa, Senator Obani Koro, Senator Muda Shiru, who was also a member of the House with us, and of course, Honour members of the House who accompanied the nominee. Uh, I want to thank everyone for this. And Honourable Minister, I want to thank you for responding to the questions, but I think my mind is also agitated with the fact that we have to think deep and wide enough on how to fund our infrastructure. Borrowing is an option, but can we really look other ways to see if we can combine the borrowing with uh, other mechanisms of funding so that we are able to uh, create the infrastructure that we need for this country. With this, I put the question. Those in favor that the nominee takes a bow and go say aye. aye. Those again say nay. The ayes have it. You can take a bow. My colleague, you are a good man, sound, no doubt about it. I allow him now. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. You, are you have all elogized your colleagues as senators. Let me elogize my colleague as a governor, one time governor of this. My governor, my governor. My governor, my governor. <laughs> now, Mr. Nominee. I know you are someone that thinks outside the box. But from all I have had so far, excellent presentation, just like many other great people have spoken. My 
question here is that considering your experience for the past four years as an honorable minister of this critical sector of our economy, infrastructure, power, housing, works, which if summed together, these are the key infrastructures that determines a nation's development. In the first place, I would have expected that the, ministry, the three ministries is too large to have been handled by just one person. And look at my friend now, having gray hair at a very young age. <laughs> so my question would be, my friend, there's one silent point here which I want you to address. Issue of funding. Because this will amount to an academic exercise if there's no money for you to perform. My colleagues who have spoken before me have mentioned the number of roads. I don't want to talk about Imo, that had only five kilometers of road from federal government, the airport road. And about four kilometers have been done or something. The question is, how do you want to address this issue of funding? Would you, and let me give a little way to it. Would you, because I think in Nigeria, we are cutting our coat according to material available, a size, not according to material available. And if we keep cutting our coat according to our, our size, the material cannot cover it. The entire budget of this National Assembly is not up to the, the budget of the fire department of New York. And here, the question is, is the funding. What, how, what will be the new thing you tell Nigerians as to the issue of funding? And if funding, how much do you really require to tackle the issue of power, power in Nigeria? How much is required? And issue of discourse, would you say discourse is a, is a success story or was it a political Roundabout. Thank you. The of the whole, my distinguished colleagues, I am Sadiq Sulaiman Umar, representing the good people of Kwaranat. Mr. Nominee, congratulations for your nomination. I have a very simple question, and this has to do with regulation. Regulation, regulation of goods and services. Mr. Nominee, the regulation in any country determines how anybody, the citizens, and in fact other countries takes a country serious. In Nigeria, what is your opinion as regards what is responsible for suboptimal performance for our regulatory agencies and the regulatory professional bodies. And again, what will you say we need to do to push them in the right path so that you know we can put behind us all this building collapse, poor substandard adulterated drugs, name it, all these problems. What will you say? What do we need to do? Because this the activities of regulators is directly proportional to how citizens take a government serious, how they be committed to the country, and how indeed other countries will take us serious. Thank you.